Hello, everyone. This is such a thrill to be here. These are some things that are happening in the country that I'm from, the United States. This is probably not unfamiliar in other countries around the world. Hate crimes have been up in the US. There's voter suppression going on for people trying to exercise their right to vote. And there is water that is poisoned and contaminating uh, the water supply of cities in multiple, multiple cities in the country. But there are also some really good things happening in the United States. In San Francisco, for instance, there's school system reform happening where parents are going to soon be able to choose where to send their children and not have to go through a lottery system. In Chicago, just a couple weeks ago, Muslim communities came together, African American Muslims and Arab American Muslims, to talk about racism within their communities. And in Nashville, a park, was rededicated to the African-American community there after being uh, misnamed for a long time, which I'll get to shortly. So how did these good things come to pass? Was it a protest that led to school reform? Was it a petition that a bunch of people had to organize and sign in order for people to come together? Was court and the judicial system involved in order for a park to be renamed? No, it was actually just three people who made this change happen, Lamont, Luann, and Denise. Now, you might not recognize them because they are not famous. They're just everyday people who live in their communities who were curious and had questions. And to be fair, it wasn't just their curiosity that made these changes happen. It was the fact that newsrooms actually listened to what they wanted to know, and they responded to them. So I'll tell you what I mean here. Lamont wanted to know how exactly the school lottery system works in the town that he lives in, San Francisco, because he's got little kids, he's trying to figure out how to send them to schools in his neighborhood, so everything's convenient in his life and theirs, and he likes the schools, but the system is really opaque and difficult to understand. So KQED, a newsroom in San Francisco, gave him the opportunity to ask his question. He asked about the school lottery system. They thought it was a good idea. It's a pretty opaque process. And they decided to do a very comprehensive story explaining how the system worked to allow people to understand what power or power they didn't have in choosing where their kids went to school. Now, just a couple weeks ago, it turns out that the school lottery system is changing. There's people on the board who are calling for it to change. And why did this happen? Because they heard this story and they really became upset and understanding how, how difficult this is for parents. And we thought, oh, could it have been the story that made the difference? And it turns out it was. This is a reporter from KQED who has insider knowledge saying that uh, the reason that this is changing is because of this story. It's because of this question that Lamont had. Now, another example, Luann. She's just a regular person in Chicago, and she drives by a couple different mosques on her way to work, and she wanted to know if Arab American Muslims and African American Muslims ever hang out together, or are the mosques kind of segregated based on you know, where people have come from, their religion, their race, their class. And so WBEZ in Chicago, a newsroom that I reported in, likewise was open to her question, and so she was able to ask it. And so instead of a reporter coming in to you know, deliver the news and tell the story, they invited four different imams to have a conversation to answer that question for themselves. They came into the studio, they had this conversation, and at the end of the conversation, something really beautiful happened. They said, you know what, this is an issue, and we should do something about it. So a few months later, they decided to invite WBEZ and the reporters to facilitate a conversation within their faith communities to talk about racism, prejudice, class, things that they were experiencing that they hadn't really talked about before because of Luann's question. And so here's a photo from this event just a couple weeks ago that happened of Arab American and African American Muslims coming together to figure out how they could share their faith in new ways. This was not for a story. This is not for, you know, the, the reporters didn't go out to do this, to put it on their air or to put it on their website. They did it as a service to the people who are asking them to help. Now, one last story, and this is one of my favorites. Denise lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and she drives by a park all the time called Fred Douglas Park. And she figures if a park is named after someone, that person is probably famous. So she didn't know who Fred Douglas was, and she just asked. Again, a newsroom was willing to listen. They took her question, and they started to look into it. 
Now, immediately they thought, hmm, there's a man named Frederick Douglass, which is pretty close to this name, but it's spelled wrong. And he was a very famous person. He was an abolitionist who worked to abolish slavery. And the newsroom started to look at the archives and try and understand who is Fred Douglass, because there's no famous Nashville person named Fred Douglass. And the newsroom didn't stop at just wondering this. They kept on it, publishing more and more stories, digging deeper and deeper into the archives. And they could do this because they have time to do this. They're journalists. This is what they're supposed to do. Denise, meanwhile, has a job. She doesn't have time to be looking into these things. Lo and behold, a few months later, the city council came together to officially clarify the name of the park because it turns out it was supposed to be named after Frederick Douglass and spelled correctly. But 80 years ago, when the park was dedicated, the city wasn't ready, apparently, to dedicate it to this man. So they shortened his name to Fred, they misspelled it, and they wanted to infantilize him by not giving him his due. And so earlier this year, the park was rededicated to Frederick Douglass in the African American community of Nashville because of Denise's question. And you can also see there, there's a Frederick Douglass impersonator who also showed up, I love that touch. So these are things that can happen when someone is curious and when the people in power, which is a newsroom, have the courage to listen to them and to do things differently. Now, this is not how things traditionally work in newsrooms. I call newsrooms autocracies because they really operate as such for the most part. There's a small group of people who make decisions on behalf of a very large group of people at a distance. There's actually no information flow happening. And this is a real problem. They make these decisions, they throw their content over the wall, and then they just keep going. This is an even bigger problem when newsrooms don't really represent the people that they're trying to serve, whether that's by their race, their class, their ethnicity, their life experiences. They have limited perspectives that are going to inherently lead to limited outcomes because they're just a few people who don't have the life experience of everyone else. Now, this isn't really a surprise because news was designed for a different age, the machine age, in which the real goal was to get things out and get it quickly because not everyone could get that information and they were in charge of being the people who got information to the public. In the US, we have this phrase of, we have all these beasts to feed. So the entire machinery of the newsroom is optimized for speed and distribution and getting that information as quickly as possible, beating your competitors. Where it used to be, you know, getting the, the paper to press, now it's getting, you know, the smartphone alert or the Alexa, you know, uh, voice alert or the video out into the world. And it's no surprise that the public was not ever involved because that would be inefficient. That would be harder. That would be less predictable. And so the public was shut out of the decision-making process because there wasn't a reason to bring them in. And then they were really just treated as a consumer from which to extract value. So the content was thrown out their way and then we said, please give us money for this. Thank you very much. Put in another way, this is kind of how journalism acts. It's at a, a distance from the public. It is elevated. It looks at the public as a series of demographics or data or dollar signs, as an abstraction. And how newsrooms typically approach this is with this kind of paternalistic, you know, this is what we think you need to know, public. We're going to tell you what we think is important. And this is how it looks when you get down to the granular level of how stories are created. The public is not meaningfully involved in any decisions. They only get to be involved after publication, after all the decisions have been made and the newsroom is running on to their next story because, hey, they have a beast to feed. They don't have time to sit around and learn from each other. They have to keep reporting. And when the public is involved, maybe they can comment, uh, which we know is not the most productive place for insight and discovery, as it turns out. So there's an emerging newsroom operating system that I've been working hard with other reporters around the world to start to imbue into newsroom culture. And it's really designed for the information age. Right now, we all have infinite choices as to what we're reading, what's getting our attention. And so instead of newsrooms being the first to beat their competitors, they need to be the most relevant and useful to the people that they're serving. And so the question has to change. Instead of the beast to feed, and instead of how quickly can we get this out there, they need to change to help, understand, help the public understand what they can do or learn. And in order to do that, the public has to be involved. They have to be able to tell them what it is that they would like to understand or learn. They need to be present at the editorial table when decisions are being made. 
And this changes the relationship in a really profound way. They become treated instead of as a consumer, as a partner. And instead of someone to extract value from, it's someone to create value for. And so put in another way, it's elevating the public and treating them as individuals with rich stories and insights, not just a big mass and an abstraction, but people who are valuable, who have things to share, who have things that will make stories that make their communities better. And the operative question here is, what do you not know that we can find out for you? Because you can Google all day long and find lots of different things out there, but what do you not know? What information hasn't been produced yet by a, by a reputable source? That's what we can provide for you. So how this can look in a story is really exciting. The public can be involved at every step of the way if the newsroom so chooses. So not only can they ask their questions, but the newsroom can curate the best ideas, put them up for a vote, and let the public actually decide what content is being made on their behalf. Because if citizens are the most important actor in a democracy, then they need to get the information to do their work as citizens. And another exciting thing is that in the process of reporting newsrooms, can invite those people whose questions they're asking to be part of that process, to really see how journalism is made and to shape it and shape the narratives that are created for their community. And this feedback cycle can just keep happening over and over again. There's really no end in sight. Curiosity is a renewable resource and it's always there for the newsrooms if they're willing to listen. So this is really rewriting the power of journalists. It's not taking power away from them, it's actually generating new power. They go from being a gatekeeper to being a connector. And they go from being responsible for every part of a story cycle to just being responsible for some things, the things that only they have time and expertise to do, which is to get that information, synthesize it, write it clearly, put it out into the world. And instead of working for the public, they start to work with the public. Now this also rewrites the role of the power of the public. So traditionally they've been passive. Now they are active. They've been a consumer and now they are actually creative. They are tapped into. And where before they could really have no influence on what stories were reported, except for clicking on things and you know, trying to get those metrics up so newsrooms repeated, now an individual can have direct influence on what stories get reported. So Harkin is the company that I've been running for the last three years, trying to systematize this process and help newsrooms work it into their everyday methodologies. And the word Harkin means listen. And as a company, our mission and our belief is that every individual is worthy of being heard. And right now we're working with about 150 newsrooms in 17 countries, helping them slowly start to change that machinery from being optimized for speed to being optimized for trust and for relevance. And what this does is this changes the possibilities of the narratives that are in the world. So most news is kind of about right now, and it's looking at what recently happened or what may happen pretty soon. It's fairly short-sighted. But when the public is involved, they have questions that break that cycle. They want to know, how did something get to be the way that it is? That could be a very long story. That could be very involved. It could take much longer than going to a press conference and running back and reporting a, a quick summation. They also want to know, how does something work now? For instance, someone was asking, how does security factor into designing a new school? In the US, we have a very big problem with school shootings. And they want to know, what is the process? How are we changing right now to make our kids safe? And then my favorite thing is the what is possible stories that result from this approach. Here in Montreal, people wanted to know, could churches house the homeless in the very, very cold weather? And this is resulting in churches starting to talk about how they can be useful in the evenings and not just on the weekends. So traditional stories are typically about those in power or those without any power, and they often revolve around conflict. And they're all about things that are immediate or about to happen soon. But when the public is involved, we can expand that frame and create stories that are more reflective and representative, not just of the most powerful and the least powerful, but as people that are just like us. And we also can create constructive narratives that create a new future. And we can have a longer view of who we are and, and what we're doing beyond the day to day. 
And what I love is when newsrooms actually bring the public into the process of reporting and that they're reflected in the final content, whether that's hearing their voice on the radio or seeing their, their face in a video. Here are two curious citizens, two everyday people who had questions in their communities, who have become the protagonists of their own stories. So when other people are reading or listening to this content, they hear someone just like them. They see themselves in the news. They feel more connected to it. And they become the hero in their own lives and new things can happen. So I'll tell you a quick story about how something like this went from just being a story to someone's life. This woman, Janice Thompson, lived in Europe for a long time. And on her electricity bill, it showed her how much of the electricity came from natural gas produced through fracking. And this was really helpful for her. She was able to see a really good picture of where her energy came from. When she moved back to the US, her energy bill was very, very indirect. It didn't tell her where energy came from. She had no idea, and she was, she was curious. So she asked WBEZ where this energy comes from and how she can know. And I was working at WBEZ at the time on the series, trying to get answers for her. And we felt really, really bad because we did two stories that showed how impossible it is for us to get her that information. In a way, it was a service just to tell her how opaque the process was and how difficult it is to actually track this because of the way that the systems are set up. And, you know, the things that I hate is when we can't get someone a satisfying answer. So we had to call her and say, this is the best we could do. We're sorry. But about a year later, we got a Google alert with her name in it and Curious City, the series that we had. And it turns out that she had become so interested in electricity because we brought her along for the process. We brought her into the newsroom. We showed her how it worked. We conferred with her at every step of the way that she decided to quit her job to become an educator about electricity in the community. She felt responsible to teach other people because she now had this knowledge. I wish I could quote this entire post because every sentence is gorgeous. But she thought at first, why am I doing this? This is a subject best left to experts. Who am I? I'm just a nobody. I don't know about electricity. But the fact that we paid attention to her and that we listened gave her energy and gave her insight and allowed her to see herself rewriting her own role in the community so that she could be helpful to other people who are wondering the same thing. Now, the great thing about this is, is it's not just good for the journalism, but it's also good for the business, is what we're finding. It's kind of obvious when we lay it out, but the more your audience feels heard, the more that they can see you're serving them directly, the more likely they are to trust you and to pay you. And we know that if newsrooms don't get their economic models right, they collapse, they go away, and democracy is imperiled. So this is not just a nice thing to do, it's really a necessary thing we have to do. And what we've been finding is that these sorts of stories that start with the public really satisfy a lot of needs. They are deep audience engagement that leads to content that outperforms other content many times over. Because it's coming from someone's real lived experience, not a press conference or someone trying to get a newsroom's attention. And then it also generates leads for that news organization, email addresses, people that now the marketing department can ask to subscribe if they're not already part of that journalism. And so I won't read off all of these stats, but suffice it to say that it's very good for business to listen to the public. It's not just good for the mission. Now, rewriting this relationship in newsrooms doesn't just start with the public's questions, but it starts with our own as journalists, as people who are responsible for putting this work out into the world. And oftentimes I hear when I'm speaking with news organizations, these two questions, which I can't stand. <laughs> One is, you know, should we report what the public wants or what they need? And it's this false dichotomy that just starts from a, a very paternalistic point of view. When you do this and you ask these questions, you know, the newsroom is in the position of deciding. You only know after publication if what you did was actually relevant and then if you're looking for what the public wants, a lot of times that results in clickbait, stories that don't actually serve any purpose and are just meant for people to you know, click on quickly and consume. And you know that they worked because you know, your charts are showing you that it was a very popular story. Now when you do the stories that people quote unquote need, these tend to be important stories, you know, ones that win awards, but maybe people haven't you know, consumed as much because we're smart and the people, you know, they don't know what's good for them. Again, this, this really puts the newsroom in a position of a parent, 
And I don't think that's uh, necessary in this day and age when we're all individuals who have free will and are, are able to ask really smart questions. But if instead you change the question to what does the public not know that we could find out for them, the public gets to be the one in the driver's seat. And you get to know before you spend the time and money and resources reporting what actually matters to them. And then the stories that result are infinite variety. They're not just the horse race of politics or the same old thing. They open up our democratic imagination into what's possible. And the way that journalists know that what they did was effective is they just answer the damn question. <laughs> they don't need to look at analytics. They don't need to get awards, although those things happen as well as a byproduct. They just satisfy someone's curiosity. And so this puts the position of the newsroom instead of as a parent, as a servant. And I think that's a more appropriate role of a newsroom in this day and age. So for those of you who are not working in the media, I wanna leave you with a question, which is what do you wonder about that you wish a journalist would investigate? Because after all, that's their job. They have the time, they have the resources, they have the expertise to get answers for you. And if you do work in a newsroom or you do have the power of telling stories and getting them out to a wider audience, I want you to answer what would it take for you to listen to them. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>